Hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Marta Kai. I'm one of the uh, five instigators of the Grant Reunion project. At, uh, and some of the instigators are with us also uh, today. Um, this is a third gathering in a series of 10 that we have every third Saturday of, of the month since September to next June. And um, today we are meeting with Ingrid Pramken, whom I would like to very warmly welcome here with us. And together with Ingrid, we, um, we prepared the online magazine issue, the November issue of the Grand Reunion Online Magazine, which is focused on the ghosts and on the rooted ontology, the gathering of ghosts or the ghostly gathering. And um, today we will have a meeting with ghosts or a kind of guided walk through ghosts and, and different haunting matters. So I would like to give it over to Ingrid. Hi, thanks, Marta. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, so how we conceived of uh, this afternoon is to see it as a, a sort of a studio visit. Um, in the past two weeks, um, I invited seven other artists to uh, join me in my research on ghosts. Um, and we want, I wanted to invite them to look at the research that they're already doing, but through the lens of the ghost. And those artists are uh, Miela Brebenel, Mayfield Brooks, Rodrigo Batista, Raza Alksnite, and Josi Vervloesem, Mathieu Charles, and Nawel Cano, who are here uh, with us today and will join me in this, uh, in this gathering. So I invited them into my ongoing research into this complex and layered nature of reality and our experience of it. And in my work, I try to look through the lenses of ghosts and plants as expressions of the reality of time that gives us kind of hints of how we could live otherwise, how we could live in a time that is not linear and in a way that is not extractivist. And this for me, working with ghosts, working with plants is a, a very clear political project. And the goals of that are also very clear. Um, and this is to contribute to the abolishment of racism, capitalism, and ecological destruction. And in turn, making space for emergent regenerative cultures. So over the past two weeks, um, this group talked about many things. We analyzed linear time, the belief that there is a past that flows neatly into the present and then is forever gone, and that there is a future as a consequence of the now, that is clearly defined and ahead of us. And this linear time, we believe, is a collective hallucination, a sort of mental illness. We analyze linear time as a disease that has spread over the world, a pandemic, a pandemonium. We repeat, we repeat the linear time of death, the deadline, while the universe is actually repeating circles. The clock turns out to be a kind of weapon, and we are pushed to recognize linear time as an excruciating kind. I don't know if it's only me, but I'm afraid we lost you, Ingrid, for a while. Yes, we all did. Ingrid, are you still there? Yes, you are. I we am. just lost you for like. At the last sentence, I guess. It says my internet connection is unstable. That's great. Um, maybe if I turn my computer like this, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying uh, that the clock turns out to be a kind of weapon and that we are pushed to recognize linear time as an excruciating kind of violence that we are not only putting onto ourselves, but also onto the more than human world. Some wondered, about when and how we could feel another way of being in time? Can we feel this thick layer time which acknowledges the ghosts and the agency of what is no longer and not yet? 
Some spoke about possession, nostalgia. We built shrines and looked for whale bones. Some spoke about undead and living ghosts, zombies representing the spirits of those enslaved, trapped within their own flesh. Some spoke about the nation state as a space that is highly charged with bad deaths and their ghosts. The state as a technology of the repetition of oppression, the repetition of oppression, the repetition of oppression obsessed with the fear of penetration. But ghosts have no boundaries. Some spoke about possession. The clock turns out to be a weapon. Some are running in circles, magic circles. Some started to dream about spells that can undo linear time, overlaying a new repetition, shaking with gravity, a floppy conjuring, spelling something out that is illegible. Some listened for interference and danced with the ghosts inhabiting our own bodies, trying to become a circuit that is at the end, that is at the same time listening and speaking. Some were exhilarated by the allowance to be violent themselves. Some wanted a sacrifice. Some were grateful for sadness. Some are becoming both alive and dead simultaneously. So we wanted to see this as a studio visit and we want to share with you some uh, excerpts from texts that we have been reading and talking about. And at the end, we want to try and make a little spell for undoing the linear time that we are trapped in behind our computers here on Zoom. So maybe one of my fellow residents wants to start off with uh, a reading. I read from a book of Avery Gordon, Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination. Haunting raises specters and it alters the experience of being in linear time alters the way we normally separate and sequence the past, the present and the future. These specters are ghosts appear where the trouble they represent and symptomize is no longer being contained or repressed or blocked from view. To my mind, the whole essence, if you can use that word, of a ghost is that it has a real presence and it demands its due, demands your attention. End of the quote. Okay, I can follow up with a quote from, from Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet by Anat Singh and many others from the introduction. As humans reshape the landscape, we forget what was there before. Ecologists call this forgetting the shifting baseline syndrome. Our newly shaped and ruined landscapes become the new reality. Admiring one landscape and its biological entanglements often entails forgetting many others. Forgetting in itself remakes landscapes and we privilege some assemblages over others. Yet ghosts remind us. Ghosts point to our forgetting, showing us how living landscapes are imbued with earlier tracks and traces. Ghosts remind us that we live in an impossible present a time of rupture, a world haunted with the threat of extinction. Deep histories tumble in unruly graves that are bulldozed into gardens of progress. Yet Arts of Living, Living on a Damaged Planet is also a book of weeds, the small, partial and wild stories of more than human attempts to stay alive. Ghosts too are weeds that whisper tales of the many pasts and yet to comes that surround us. Considered through ghosts and weeds, worlds have ended many times before. Endings come with the death of a leaf, the death of a city, the death of a friendship, the death of small promises and small stories. The landscapes grown from such endings are our disaster as well as our weedy hope. 
end of quote. I quote in Spanish and then I translate it to English. I'm quoting Soraya Maicoño. La historia cambia y la vamos a cambiar a través de una forma de vida que es ancestral y es política. ¿Cuánto tiempo nos callaron? Está sucediendo una transformación, una transformación verdadera. Y sí, eso va a traer consecuencias porque estamos oprimidos y necesitamos no estar no más. History change, and we are going to change it through a, for, a way of living that is ancestral, and it's politi politics. <laughs> for how long we have been silenced. It is happening, a transformation, a real transformation. And yes, this is going to bring consequences because we are oppressed and we need to not be anymore. End of quote. Um, so we talked a lot about ghosts um, and I've been reading the book, Ghosts of the, Ghosts of the African Diaspora. And I will quote, um, uh, um, a part about uh, violence and the reproduction of violence. So quote, how does one represent violence without reproducing it? How does one give a voice to the voiceless without speaking for them, thus silencing them again? Oh no, I'm sorry, so something happened with my Oh yeah, I'm back. Um, so without silencing them again. It seems that it is indeed impossible, but that it is nevertheless essential to try and to fail. As an oxymoron, a walking paradox, the ghost is crucial in this attempt to both tell an impossible story and to amplify the impossibility of its telling, end quote. I quote the silence presence of my companion during the lockdown. End of quote. I quote from a book, um, Radical Botany, which talks about another book called uh, Un Sommet de Plantes, a book written by Anne Richter. It's about Anya, the uh, main character is Anya. Anya makes a choice informed by a feminist critique of patriarchal family life to exist as a plant rather than as a married woman. And maybe I continue on that. It's not a quote, but it's a, it's a picture from a book called Encyclopédie de la Divination by Henri Verrier. Um, it's a picture um, talking about uh, reading the future in your hands. And this, the middle finger, um, represents our relation to time. So, fuck time. I will quote from Derrida's Spectres of Marx.
If it, learning to live, remains to be done, it can happen only between life and death, neither in life nor in death alone. What happens between two and between all the twos one likes, such as between life and death, can only maintain itself with some ghost, can only talk with or about some ghosts. So it would be necessary to learn spirits. I skip a bit. To learn to live with ghosts in the upkeep, the conversation, the company, or the companionship, in the commerce without commerce of ghosts, to live otherwise and better. No, not better, but more justly, but with them. No being with the other, no socius, without this with that makes being with in general more enigmatic than ever for us. And this being with specters would also be a politics of memory, of inheritance and of generations. Inheritance and generations, generations of ghosts, which is to say about certain others who are not present nor presently living, either to us, in us or outside us. It is in the name of justice. Of justice where it is not yet, not yet there, where it is no longer, where it is no longer present. End of quote. Also, again from Afri um, Ghosts of the African Diaspora. Communicating with the dead has always served not only a cultural and social function, but also a political one. As African diasporic communities have used obea, vodun, spirit possession, conjure, and other forms of ritualized performances as resistant practices. Joseph Roach even speaks of the revolutionary potential of the spirit world presence in African diaspora culture and literature from colonial and slavery times through Jim Crow, a revolutionary potential that can be historically linked to the spiritual practices that often accompanied slave revolts." End quote. I quote from In the Dust of This Planet by Eugene Takers. The aim then of the device as a magic circle is primarily a philosophical one, rather than assuming the division between the natural and the supernatural and then utilizing the magic circle to manage or govern the boundary between them in From Beyond, it's a tale, a story from um, H.P. Lovecraft. The magic circle is used to reveal the already existing non-separation between natural and supernatural the here and now and the beyond. I'm quoting Liliana, Liliana Ancalaos. When I die, I should cross the river. When I die, I should cross the river. But what dog will guide me as I have none? A skinny dog, dog that smells my cowardice will walk at my side and the old lady will be in the boat. I will give her two bits of copper to take me across. Stones uprooted from my throat, my stomach, cultivated in pain and the shouts I couldn't hear when my eyes went wide and made me alive. I will hand over those sto stones and nothing more but tears, because I failed to find life's secret, because I went after ghosts, chasing stories and spiders and jugs and leaves. Will the old lady know their worth? My dog and I will climb aboard. The raft 
will slide into the afternoon, heading west. We'll arrive, and my little sister needs to be there. She has to be. Death can't be a nothingness of fire painted by paintbrush for a bird. She will have visible scars in her eyes, eyes more focused than ever, that I will delve into me, put every thorn from me, trace my face with her fingers, a rare footprint, the fire burning over blue stones, will eat beating hearts, and my sister will paint a cultrun in the air with the blood. Afterward, I won't know if I'm a horse or a gasp in the wind or a gasp. If, if the wind is a trutruca and will go galloping to cut loose the stars from the river. And in the circular movement, I will know at once that it, it is to be a, what is to be a warrior running freely towards death, what visions burn in him. We'll return to be green, plain, and folks will be gathered around a fire, blackened pots, a moon, and every leaf on the poplar shining. So I will remember them from afar and die once more. Of the flat neighborhoods of home, rising in vertigo from the city's horizon, plastic bags and the stars there, between the cables of the illuminated public, here I disagree with the translator, between the cables of the streets, of the lights in the street, end of quote. I have uh, one more about time. Writers and scholars of the African diaspora, among others, have long contested the linear hierarchical vision of a single history that would run its unique course and denounced it as a highly functional fantasy of the West. Not only has the definition of history as a march of progress served to relegate some peoples to the margins or indeed outside of history, but in consigning things, events, or institutions to the past, the chronological disillusion or delusion also obscures their continuing effects in the presence, be they symbolic, social, or material." End quote. I have a quote from uh, Karen Barat meeting the universe halfway. Now we'll make it short because it's complicated. The existence of the quantum discontinuity means that the past is never left behind, never finished once and for all. And the future is not what will come to be in an unfolding of the present moment. Rather, the past and the future are enfolded participants in matter's iterative becoming. Becoming is not an unfolding in time, but the inexhaustible dynamism of the unfolding of mattering." End quote. Again, from Avery Gordon. When home becomes unfamiliar, when your bearings on the world lose direction, when the over and done with comes alive, when what's being in your blind view comes into view.
again from Liliana Calao from the poem, The Women of Cushaman. Time is a blade that comes down on you and cuts away the excess, the words, the tears, the long looks at your babies. End of quote. Are we out of quotes? I am. Yeah. Um, in that case, I would like to propose a little exercise, a little um, test for making a spell of undoing the linear time that we are currently engaging with through this medium of Zoom on our laptops or on our phones. And, uh, and after this, we can have a little chat and questions and all of that stuff. Um, but what we will need for this um, is a paper and something to write. And I would like you to find an object around you in your house, on your desk, that could somehow represent a different time than this violent uh, linear time of the deadline of the clock uh, that we are in. And if you have found this, please turn on your camera for a little moment. You don't have to show yourself if you don't want to, but put the object in front of the, in front of the camera. Great. It's like a, a shrine. And so in order to prepare ourselves for the undoing of linear time on our laptops, um, we have to prepare the body to sense this other times. And so sit comfortably and close your eyes for a moment and you can hold the object and just like focus on it, like how it feels in your hand, how you imagine it looks now that your eyes are closed. And start to focus on your breath. You don't have to change anything about your breath. Just notice how it comes in and out of the body. Notice its rhythm, its repetition. knowing that when the breath finds its own rhythm, everything that is not in place in the body 
will return to be in place. And follow the breath down through your throat, making space in your throat. And follow the breath down into your heart, making space in your heart. And follow the breath down through your belly, expanding there. And follow the breath down into your pelvis. And see how a bright blue light starts to shine in your belly. And with every breath, this light is growing and it's spreading all the way down to your toes, to your fingertips, your whole spine is filled with this bright blue light. And see how the bright blue light is expanding outside of your body, touching what surrounds you. And now feel how you are completely filled up with this bright blue light. And feel how every cell in your body is completely alive. And now feel and know how time is expanding inside your body. Where do you feel it expand? With what speed does it expand? And now see and feel how time is an ocean. How are you swimming in the ocean of time? And when you know, you can breathe out and open your eyes. If you are back from swimming in time, then take your entity of nonlinear time, the object that you're holding, and circle it around your laptop or phone three times counterclockwise. And now, Hold the object in your hand and take your pen and your paper and take a moment to draw your spell against linear time. And I would propose to draw without lifting your hand and to draw how it feels inside from this experience we just had, for linear time to become something else, however you have experienced it.
And when you're ready drawing, you take the paper, fold it up and put it under your laptop. And this procedure is to be repeated for the next 21 days. Thank you. Thanks. So now we have some time for questions and thoughts. Thanks a lot, Ingrid. Please do feel free to um, ask any kind of questions or maybe share any kind of thoughts that might or come to your mind. Um, you can do it via microphone, you can turn on your camera, you don't have to turn on your camera, you can also put it in the chat as you wish. Are there any at the moment, immediate um, echoes, remarks, thoughts? maybe while waiting for them and to sort of break the ice. Um, I could ask uh, kind of um, referring also to the, to the context of the, of the magazine we did together with Ingrid, which is um, only partly based on text. It's also very much based on um, or consists of drawings and uh, different forms, sounds, soundscape, uh, objects, different forms of materializing ghosts, if you like, or traces. And I wanted to ask you, Ingrid, but also um, your colleagues who were part of the, or are part of the residency um, in the virtual Antwerp, um, what kind of um, embodied practices of noticing the traces or the ghosts you experience, if any other than, um, yeah, reading their presence with, with the sight, um, is it any kind of, yeah, any other senses that were involved in uh, encountering the ghosts and, and following the traces? Mm. Yeah, I think for me personally, it's always a challenge to move away from reading and writing because I feel so comfortable there. <laughs> but um, uh, that's also why I invited people who have other, uh, other tools at their disposal, uh, which was really uh, fun. So uh, Mayfield uh, taught us a little protection spell that was really about shaking and surrendering to gravity somehow as a way to trust that there is protection in gravity and in this process of um, going into the earth and allowing this cycle of composting to take place. Um, uh, many of us built shrines uh, Raza Alksnite is working uh, uh, with building shrines together with her dog who likes to chew up all kinds of stuff. And this stuff is becoming material for the shrines for the ghosts of her village. So she is now installing these shrines to appease and uh, bring notice to multiple ghosts. And I think that inspired many of us to start this practice of like collecting items and making a little shrine that has a um, 
this intention to focus in on, on a specific presence. Um, yeah, so those were two, two things uh, that have definitely uh, been explored. Yeah, I don't know, like the, the whole idea of the ghosts is of course that you can't see the ghosts, the ghosts themselves. You can only see their imprint, like you can only see their absence. And this you see through what is, has been present around that which has become a ghost. So, so anyway, the eyes are not, um, are never enough. Like, how can you notice something that is no longer there? You also have to kind of attune the body, I guess, to, to noticing this absence before your eyes even notice it. Uh, we were um, talking, and I, myself in particular, trying to, that of course, ghosts, um, and as this idea of rep repetition and very much uh, and present in the body as being possessed, but also there are traces there that mostly we understand them as trauma in many cases, but also as, as um, places uh, and way of performing that are present, that is not necessarily trauma that we are embodied by the ghosts of what I'm exploring, uh, the ghosts of national state. No, that is not only, and to work with that uh, tension or patriarchy, uh, uh, to work, yeah, it's because it's not something that is visible and it's not something that you can have a relationship of cause eff effect, but it's present there. So yeah, we have been, exploring those um, presence there. Um, yeah, from, um, from my research or the things that I tried to, to, um, to look into is uh, the ghosts of uh, of oneself, uh, all these different versions of yourself that have existed and no longer exist, but you have known or you were at one point. Um, and as such, when we look at time as a nonlinear event or nonlinear action or experience uh, or perception, um, all these versions still exist of yourself, but now as ghosts, in the sense that you are today who you are at this moment of, of time. But these, there are all these other versions of yourself that also still exist, but are, not, are no longer yourself. Um, so in that sense, um, I have perceived many ghosts, uh, of, but it was all uh, parts of myself that are no longer me, and perhaps also in the ghosts of the future, because there are also, of course, uh, versions of myself that already exist in the future, or the future that we see in the linear time co concept as, as a future, um, but also exists today, but just not perceivable uh, uh, in, uh, at this point of time, to me at least. Um, so, that's something I have been looking into uh, also in order to perhaps communicate or just to see uh, these versions of myself um, communicate with people who are no longer here in the physical, um, but are still very much present because this, these versions of myself still exist. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, uh, it's what I've been uh, looking into. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Can you ask a question for like all four yeah, of you? Of course. 
Yeah, I was also interested, uh, like, what were the crossing points or, let's say, common ghosts that you experienced within this collective residency or, like, ghosts that you didn't expect and anticipate before you met together? Thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I think what was surprising, it wasn't surprising because I'd never thought of it, but it was surprising the space that it took up was um, how the concept of the state became very central in some of our conversations and how that this construction, this, this social agreement of the state is something incredibly violent and incredibly um, uh, filled with, with bad ghosts. And um, yeah, I think this was maybe not surprising, but uh, such a concrete focus point that we ended up talking about and the relationship between ghosts, the state and penetration was quite a surprising and, uh, and interesting, uh, um, yeah, interesting meeting point that also Rodrigo Batista brought up. And we kept circling back to this, to this very particular construction and this very particular kind of violence and how that is very connected to this idea of linear time, uh, exporting linear time, and how uh, yeah, the export of linear time in the process of colonization, and how uh, this is, of course, this kind of linear time is, um, like, is a necessity for capitalism to exist and to take such control over our life. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that was, was, I think, one of the meeting points that I did expect, but I didn't expect it to be so explicit. And I think another point that was quite surprising was maybe our, um, uh, this notion of violence, but also um, that there might be a need and a pleasure, uh, a need for and a pleasure in uh, being violent ourselves. If we are to live in this context, then what is the kind of violence that we need to cultivate? And then also there's like a lot of friction in the conversation, I think, uh, um, Surround, was there surrounding that between the, uh, this need to cultivate a different kind of violence or indeed the need to not reproduce violence uh, but to produce a counter violence. This I think was maybe a, a point of not necessarily disagreement but um, yeah <laughs> a point of uh, yeah a point of friction or, a po or like a paradox that we came into. Um, but please correct me if, if I'm wrong. But this took, like stood out for me in the conversations we had. Uh, yeah, I, I can. Uh, yeah, it, it's correct. <laughs> like uh, the, the, the discussion about violence was very prevalent um, in the sense also that, yeah, growing up in, in this violent context, violence becomes a part of, of of who you are. And um, we also talked about penetration and possession, the link between being possessed or uh, haunted bodies, like uh, yeah, you have all these, all, uh, all these forms of, of being possessed also in different cultural varieties. Um, and I think also what it means to be possessed by, by, this, uh, by this violence or even by, by, state, by state violence and, and uh, reproducing or resisting it and, and like this, this constant friction um, of, of searching for ways to be, to be in that sense, to, to live 
uh, even though, and then we, we also had conversations about zombies and, and, uh, and other monsters. Uh, because we were, yeah, we were talking about monsters, um, and then also possession is also like it's, it's, uh, where a spirit is something very um, is it cannot be touched, but when it possesses uh, a body, it becomes flesh. So it becomes uh, something much more than than not cannot be touched. It can become a monster uh, of some sorts. Um, so that to me were very interesting conversations uh, and made me reflect also more about um, about uh, yeah all these different depictions of violence um, that we're exposed to yeah I have a question for ourselves <laughs> no, I was suddenly like we're talking for two weeks about penetration, violence, but also about pleasure. Um, and a lot was on the body, like the ghost as manifests in and upon our bodies. But I never seen, apart from Ingrid's body, <laughs> I, I never seen you. So I was thinking like, how would it have been if we could have uh, been able to touch and feel each other? I, I, I don't know because I had a feeling that during the conversations we had, we had like two every day, two hour long conversations, which felt very close to me. Like you all felt very close to me. I was very personal, but it was so much on body and bodily experiences that I was like wondering, like how would we experience this when we could have been together? It's a question for you, I guess. No. <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't talk about it and <laughs> just embody our <laughs> that. Um, yeah. It's what this device produced. Like we have to talk. It's the only way it's made for that. And it would be more fun, of course. But my question is also more like, what is it, what, like, for me, it produced, it was not only like we were only speaking to each other through a device. It, it had like a certain, like Ingrid also said, it was quite full. For me, also on a sensational level, didn't stay on the screen or in my head. That's not a question, but a remark, I think. Well, I think personally that w I think when we would have been in the same room physically, perhaps um, there would be more uh, trans transfer of energy, of, of tension, of, um, of uh, because yeah, when the, the, even when we're not physically touching each other, but when you're in the same room, there is there there are different connections than than what we're having here. Uh, this this really takes away uh, a lot. Um, so I think just by by the gestures and and the way that we will, will would would have been moving in these in 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 the space where we would be together, it would. I think it would also create a, a certain ritual of being like um, into entering the room, greeting each other, um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, the talking, but then I think some things would just um, evolve in, in different ways. But um, because also I was talking about, uh, about the, 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 how, how bodies uh, are viewed. I, it was yesterday, right? Um, and how, how even our body and how we look at, at bodies is a colonial construct. Um, and, and in that sense, I, I think that even with that discussion in, in, a, in, a same, in, a, in a physical, in the same room, it would have been a very different uh, discussion because we would be very aware of our bodies in, in that sense. Um, so yeah, my, it's, it's a very interesting question. I, um, and I think definitely a, a lot of things were, 
were, um, I won't say lost because that's not the word, but um, there are many things that, that haven't manifested uh, because we did this in this, in this digital space. Uh, so perhaps there's also a ghost now of us, a reality where we have met in, in that space. There's a version, versions of ourselves in this infinite amounts of dimensions where there's no COVID-19 and we're, we're actually doing this and it's very fun. So uh, that's perhaps one soothing uh, thought that I can give. <laughs> Any more thoughts or questions at the moment? Um, maybe the last ones as we are almost reaching our time, or actually we're one minute behind already. Um, if there are none, oh no, there is one, there is, uh, ah, there is Maya. Uh, I will um, read out loud the, uh, what Maya just put on, on, on the chat. Thank you, Ingrid, Gossi, Mathieu, and Nahue for your presence, quotes, thoughts, observations, and practices. Being with you all with our non-linear objects, drawings, and beings during the time unbinding spell has been sweet. A much appreciated pulling of the oceaning here and now, a precious being otherwise amidst the flow of words. That's a beautiful thank you to you guys that I would really love to share. And I do echo these words very much. And maybe just um, a final thought kind of that I wanted to share with you is um, when, you, um, when you were um, talking about this, one of these um, perspectives or points that were coming back in your conversations and were so explicit, which is the kind of violence of the ghost of the state. Uh, it's immediately rang a bell um, in me for two reasons. One is obviously the context I'm um, in at the moment, which is the context of the, of the quite uh, violent, probably the most violent penetration of the state in my own life and uh, the life of most of, of the society right now in Poland, which is really trying to uh, penetrate our existence to the very, very uh, core of uh, core decisions that we can make. So the kind of freedom of the very basic decisions is being taken away from us. And the violence is also becoming very explicit in terms of what is happening on the streets. But um, that's not the main reason why it rang the bell so loudly. It, the, the main reason was that um, I realized that uh, very often with a ghost, what is like the first connotation that comes uh, to mind is a kind of possession of the ghost. And usually it's the possession is somehow related to something negative, right? Something that is really violent. But then I thought that none of the fights or struggles we are in at the moment are the first ones. And, and this kind of being able to, to recall the fights that already happened that we might not have witnessed, but we do have some traces or imprints of them, can be really empowering and strengthening and can really this kind of attempt or a way to build the alliances with a ghost or previous efforts, previous struggles, um, previous fights, uh, attempts. It's really something that uh, is, is, is much needed and this kind of keeps and when I think about it, this is one of the things that keeps me standing, if you like. So maybe this way of uh, looking for the alliances with the, with the goals and traces could be also uh, a very political um, uh, tool, a very political uh, gesture, if you like. And I personally find it super helpful. And I would just love to thank you a lot for, for this introduction to your your time at the residency and your guidance through the ghosts. Ingrid? Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you, Marta, for, for uh, <laughs> saying that so eloquently because that's absolutely also the point, right? Not only to, to see the ghosts created by the destruction, but also the ghosts that are rebuilding, that are constantly rebuilding and, and they are there and, and indeed we can like become their allies also not just 
they are, but we can become their allies. And, um, and this, I think, is why it's so important to see that there are other beings that are living life, expressing life radically different and expressing death radically different. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for bringing that in. Mm, thanks to you. Thank you, Ingrid, Lucy, Nahuel, and Mathieu. Thank you so much for being with us. And yeah, uh, I hope we can, I'm very happy we, we do have the traces of that conversation in terms of the recording. So I'm, I'll be super happy to come back and forth uh, to it. Thank you so much. <laughs>